Hello there. Today, I'd like to take you on an ASMR adventure into the history of a very famous ballet, The Nutcracker. The Nutcracker made its debut in St. Petersburg in 1892 with music composed by Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky and a libretto by Marius Petipa. Petipa based his libretto, which is the story for the ballet, upon a fairy tale by the author E.T.A. Hoffman called Nusknacker und Mauserkönig, which in English translates to The Nutcracker and the Mouse King. So in this talk, we're going to discover the roots of Hoffman's original Nutcracker story, uh, we'll take a look at the plot of the tale because um, it does differ quite significantly from the libretto of the ballet. And then we'll see how Hoffman's story was transformed by Petipa and Tchaikovsky into a work that would begin its life in Russia, but which would go on in time to become a festive favourite all around the world. As usual, there'll be a slideshow of images on the video to accompany our topic, but there's no need for you to look at them if you don't want to. There's also an added bonus, in that at one point during the talk, you'll hear the voice of another ASM artist. I'm delighted to say that the rather wonderfully named Shifty Russian ASMR has kindly agreed to record the St. Petersburg critic reviews of The Nutcracker for me. And she has an absolutely beautiful voice, so do listen out for her fabulous readings later on in the talk. And of course, while you listen, you can, as usual, just relax, close your eyes, and let my voice guide you. So... Welcome to the fairy tale world of the Nutcracker. Our history begins with Ernst Theodor Amadeus Hoffmann, who was a writer and also a composer of music. He was born in 1776 in Königsberg, and Königsberg itself is a place with an interesting history, because at the time when Hoffmann was born, it was part of the German Kingdom of Prussia. However, for several hundred years previously, it had been part of Poland, and today, in fact, it's actually governed by Russia, under the name of Kalingrad. So, although Hoffmann was technically German, he came from an area with very strong Polish roots, and he spent the early part of his adulthood in Warsaw, where he worked as a local government administrator. In 1807, after the Napoleonic invasion of Warsaw, he moved first to Berlin, and then eventually settled in the German medieval town of Bamberg. And if the town of Bamberg sounds familiar to you, it might be because you've listened to my recent talk on the Bamberg Hall of Birds. Once he was settled in Bamberg, Hoffman was finally able to really focus on his creative life although like most creative people, he took a variety of jobs to support himself and his family, working at different times as a theatre manager and a newspaper music critic. At the same time, he started to write stories and compose music, and by the time he wrote Nusknacker und Mauserkönig in 1816, Hoffmann was already quite an experienced author. His Nutcracker story could perhaps be described more as a novella than a short story, because it's quite long and fairly complex. It's the story of a seven-year-old girl called Marie, and her adventures with a wooden nutcracker that begin one magical Christmas Eve. You may or may not know that in Germany, Christmas presents are opened on Christmas Eve, not Christmas Day. So as the story opens... Marie and her brother Fritz are excitedly waiting for the present opening to begin, and there are several wonderful gifts brought for her and her family by her godfather, Drosselmeyer, who is an ingenious inventor and clockmaker. One of the gifts he brings is a nutcracker, 
decorated to look like a soldier, with a giant mouth that's used for cracking the nuts. And Marie instantly falls in love with this funny-looking thing, and becomes very upset when her brother Fritz breaks it. She wraps it up in her pocket handkerchief, and takes it up with her to her room when she goes to bed, carefully placing the broken nutcracker in her toy cupboard to keep it safe. It's at this point in the story that some very strange things begin to happen. All of the toys in Marie's cabinet suddenly come magically to life, and at the same time, her room is instantly filled with thousands of mice, led by the terrifying Mouse King, who has seven heads, topped with seven gold crowns. The Nutcracker rouses himself with the rest of the toys, and tries to do battle with the Mouse King, but he's still broken and can't fight properly, so it's left to Marie to save the day, which she does by hurling her shoe at the Mouse King, so that he takes fright and runs away. Marie then feels a sudden, sharp pain in her arm, and she sinks to the floor in a faint. When she regains consciousness, it's the next day, and she finds herself in bed with her arm all bandaged up. She's told that she's lost a lot of blood from cutting her arm on the glass of her toy cabinet. Did she really do battle with the Mouse King? Or was it all a dream? While she continues to convalesce from her injuries, her godfather Drosselmeyer comes to visit her and brings her the Nutcracker, which she has repaired and made good as new. The story then develops quite a complex double narrative, as Drosselmeyer himself begins to tell Marie another story, a sort of tale within the tale, about how nutcrackers came to be invented. The story he tells is extremely convoluted, but to cut a very long story short, it involves a feud between a human queen and a mouse queen, who's known as Mouse Rinx. After a quarrel between the human queen and the rodent queen, Mouse Rink's children are all killed, and in revenge, she curses the human queen's own daughter, Princess Pearlypat, by making her excessively ugly. The king and queen then call on their court astrologer and inventor, who just so happens to be called Drosselmeyer, to break the curse and restore the princess. So he sets out on a quest that lasts 15 years, but takes him nowhere, until he eventually realises that his own nephew, who lives in Nuremberg, is the very person to break the spell. So he takes his nephew to the royal court, and the nephew does indeed break the spell. Princess Pallipat's beauty is restored. But as he performs the ritual that releases her, the nephew inadvertently steps onto Mouse Rink's tail, and so then she curses him instead, turning him into an ugly nutcracker. You would think that Princess Pallipat would be able to sympathise with this, but uh, it turns out that she can't. In spite of her own previous ordeal with mouse curses, she has no compassion for the poor stricken nephew, and so she immediately banishes him from court for being too ugly. Perhaps not surprisingly, this rather bizarre story that Drosselmeyer tells to his goddaughter stays with Marie, and later on, as she lies in bed, she thinks she hears the seven-headed mouse king, who has come back, and is whispering into her ear that he is the son of Mouse Rinx, and he will bite her nutcracker into bits, unless she gives him toys and sweets. For a while Marie does this, but when she has no more treats left to give, the nutcracker comes magically back to life, and this time when he battles the Mouse King, he defeats him and makes Marie a present of the seven crowns from the rodent's head. He then whisks Marie away for a visit to the enchanted kingdom of dolls, where they travel through a variety of wonderful places, including the Christmas wood, the Rose Lake, and the Sweetmeat Grove, before finally arriving at Marchpane Castle. When Marie wakes up the next day and tells her family about her wonderful adventures, no one believes her. But later on, when Drosselmeyer comes to visit again, she tells him what's happened, 
and he tells her that he does believe her. Encouraged by this, she confides in him that, had she been in the position of Princess Pearlypat, she would have been much more kind to the Nutcracker. And as she says this, there's suddenly a loud bang. Marie faints, again. And when she wakes up, she learns that, coincidentally, of course, Drosselmeyer's young nephew, Master Drosselmeyer, has just arrived for a visit from Nuremberg. The nephew, who is of course the same nephew from Drosselmeyer's story, then tells Marie that all her dreams were true, that he was indeed the Nutcracker placed under a curse, and that she has now broken Mouserink's spell and restored him to his human form. He then asks Marie to marry him, and the story ends a year and a day later, with the pair of them getting married and going back to the kingdom of the dolls to become the king and queen of Marchpane Castle. By any standards, the Nutcracker and the Mouse King is a surreal and somewhat inconsistent story. With its was it a dream or not narrative and uh, its young girl protagonist, it foreshadows another classic fantasy story, Alice in Wonderland which was written by Lewis Carroll. Carroll didn't write Alice until 50 years after Hoffman wrote Nutcracker and Mouse King, and uh, I think he owes quite a lot to the earlier story. Like Alice in Wonderland, Nutcracker and Mouse King mixes together whimsy and satire and blends some spellbindingly magical descriptions of a fantasy world with some really quite menacing characters and atmosphere. Both stories are also deliberately haphazard and surreal in their narratives, and for modern readers, one of the most confusing and also disturbing aspects of Hoffman's story is the fact that Marie is seven years old at the start of the tale, and when she marries Master Drosselmeyer at the end of it, there's nothing to suggest that more than one year has passed, so technically she would still only be eight years old. However, it's perhaps a futile exercise to look for consistency in a story that deliberately sets out to bend logic. The reader is still drawn into the story because of the wonderful way in which Hoffman writes. His descriptions of the Kingdom of the Dolls in particular are absolutely bewitching in their beauty. Hoffman seems to really revel in the imaginative details of his marvellous world, and he describes with gusto the many gorgeous sights that Marie witnesses, such as the sugar-marbled walls of the almond and raisin gate, the gilded, sugar-plum decorated roofs of the buildings in Gingerbread Village, and the glittering, jewel-like houses in the capital city, which are made from sugar filigree. It was this beguilingly sweet imagery that made the Nutcracker story a tempting choice for Marius Petipa when he was looking for a new subject for his next ballet. By the early 1890s, Petipa had been the master of the Russian Imperial Ballet for over 20 years and he was celebrated for both his choreography and his lavish stagings of ballets at the Imperial Marinsky Theatre in St. Petersburg. He'd already collaborated once with the composer Tchaikovsky on a previous fairy tale adaptation, The Sleeping Beauty, which had premiered in 1890, and by the following year he was ready to team up with him again for a second fantasy ballet. Petipa didn't actually know the original Nutcracker story by Hoffman, but he'd read a French translation of it that had been made by the acclaimed French novelist Alexandre Dumas in 1844. And when Petipa read those descriptions of glittering sweet villages and magical landscapes, he decided that he'd found the perfect story to turn into a spellbinding new ballet. At the same time, Petipa was also certain that the most surreal and dark elements of the story would have to be cut out. The sort of show that he had in mind was a glittering Christmas spectacle that would showcase the talents of his most accomplished dancers, 
and there was no room in his vision for anything that was menacing or too complex. So, when he came to adapt the story, Patipa stripped away much of the original narrative and focused instead on only two strands of the plot. The initial Christmas Eve gift-giving that leads to the battle with the Mouse King, followed by the trip to the magical land of dolls, which Patipa decided to rename and call the Land of Sweets. On the one hand, I think he was perhaps wise to make these changes, because the original story is incredibly complicated, and uh, it might possibly have caused ballet audiences to scratch their heads in consternation. However, on the other hand, Petipa edited the story so heavily that the second act of the ballet, which is entirely set in the Land of Sweets, becomes nothing more than a series of individual sequences, with no real plot at all. This was deliberate. Patipa's intention was to create a series of set pieces that allowed his various different dances to shine. But in making that creative choice, I think he ended up fashioning a libretto that's extremely lopsided, because the first act is packed full of plot, and the second act doesn't have any plot at all. Privately, Tchaikovsky was not impressed at all with what Petipa had done. He was a great admirer of the original Hoffman story, and he felt that the stripped-down libretto didn't do it justice. Nevertheless, he was willing to undertake the commission, and also willing to bear with the minute and precise orders that Petipa gave him about how the music should be composed. It's perhaps surprising to a modern audience to realise just how much Petipa interfered with Tchaikovsky's composition process. Ah, uh, he sent him detailed notes on how many bars there should be in each section of the music, and he even dictated what the tempo of each piece should be. Today, this creative dominance over such a famous and celebrated composer might seem rather strange, particularly to music lovers who are fans of Tchaikovsky's work. Nevertheless, this was how the partnership worked, and the dynamic that existed between them was driven partly by the fact that, in the 1890s, Petipa was deemed to be the more successful of the two. Tchaikovsky had enjoyed some success, and his work was rated in particular amongst professional musicians. But his first ballet, Swan Lake, had actually bombed when it premiered, and even though The Sleeping Beauty had been better received, reviews of it had still been somewhat mixed. So Petipa, who had already enjoyed a long and very distinguished career at the Imperial Ballet, was very much in charge of the new production. And when Tchaikovsky began composing the new work in February 1891, it was on the understanding that he followed the ballet master's careful instructions. Initially, the composition went well, but Tchaikovsky's work came to an abrupt halt in April 1891, when his younger sister Alexandra, to whom he'd been very close, unexpectedly died, and the composer who already struggled with what was then referred to as melancholy was thrown into an even deeper depression by his grief. He managed to return to work only by identifying the young girl at the centre of the story, whose name had been changed by Petipa from Marie to Clara, with his sister, and he used his memories of their childhood Christmases together to fuel his work on the new ballet. By the following January, therefore, his initial sketches for the music were finished, and he had begun on the orchestration, at which point he also extracted eight key pieces from his new score and formed them into a separate orchestral work, which would become known as the Nutcracker Suite. The ballet's progress, however, came to another unexpected halt a few months later, and sadly this was also due to another family tragedy, this time for Petipa. His second daughter, 
Eugenia, had been diagnosed with bone cancer at the heartbreakingly early age of 15, and in August 1892, she died. Patipa was so overcome with grief that he withdrew completely from the Nutcracker production and left his assistant, Lev Ivanov, to create the choreography for the ballet. Ivanov had worked alongside Patipa for several years by this point, and he knew exactly what was required for the Nutcracker. So he took over the creation of the dance sequences and followed Patipa's vision, inventing a Christmas dance extravaganza that would fully display the techniques and talents of the Imperial Ballet. He did this by creating a series of character dances for the second act, in which various foodstuffs, such as tea, coffee, chocolate, and a sugar plum, magically come to life and dance. The result is an exhilarating spectacle, and indeed some ballet companies, such as the Royal Ballet in London, still base their current production of The Nutcracker on Ivanov's original choreography. When The Nutcracker premiered in December 1892, Petipa and Ivanov's aim of showcasing the dancers paid off, and the Italian prima ballerina, Antoinette Dallera, who was dancing the role of the Sugar Plum Fairy, is said to have received five curtain calls for her performance. Nevertheless, not everyone was impressed with the new ballet. The lack of a coherent plot and characterization in the second act nonplussed both audiences and critics alike, and in the Stock Exchange News, published on the 8th of December 1892, the dance critic wrote, First of all, the Nutcracker can in no event be called a ballet. It does not comply with even one of the demands made of a ballet. Ballet, as a basic genre of art, is mimed drama and consequently must contain all the elements of normal drama. On the other hand, there must be a place in ballet for pliable attitudes and dances made up of the entire essence of classical choreography. There is nothing of this in Nutcracker. There is not even a subject. Meanwhile, the review of the ballet in the St. Petersburg Gazette, which was published the following day, was also rather scathing, although it did at least acknowledge Tchaikovsky's talent. It is a pity that so much fine music is expended on nonsense unworthy of attention. But the music in general is excellent. That designated for dances is dansante, and that designated for the ear and for the fantasy is imaginative. Of Tchaikovsky's three ballets, Nutcracker is the best. Its music, indeed, is not for the normal ballet audience. In spite of this recognition, however, the bad reviews of The Nutcracker weighed heavily on Tchaikovsky, who was already struggling. He'd enjoyed a glimmer of light when his Nutcracker suite was premiered earlier in the year and had received a great deal of praise, but the attacks on the ballet in the press were probably made worse by the fact that, privately, Tchaikovsky himself shared the critics' opinions about the lack of depth in the libretto. Less than a year after the Nutcracker premiered, the composer had died, and while his official cause of death was registered as cholera, there has been a great deal of speculation and controversy in the years since his demise, with many scholars believing that he in fact committed suicide. The Nutcracker would be the last ballet that Tchaikovsky would work on, and while the Nutcracker Suite became an instant hit with orchestras all over the world, the actual ballet itself would remain a fairly overlooked production. It was revived several times within Russia, but it didn't receive its premiere outside of Russia until 1927, when an abridged version of it was performed in Budapest. 
the first complete version of it staged outside Russia, didn't take place until 1934, when it was performed at the Sadler's Wells Theatre in London. But it wasn't until 1954, more than 50 years after its original premiere, that The Nutcracker finally began to receive popular attention and acclaim. This was largely due to a new production that was produced that year by the New York City Ballet, with choreography by Georges Balanchine, a Russian-born dancer who had originally trained at the Imperial Ballet and who had actually played the part of the Nutcracker Prince on stage at the Marinsky Theatre at the age of 15. Balanchine took Petipa's original libretto and some of Ivanov's choreography and used them as the basis for his own interpretation of the ballet, which was an immediate hit. The New York Ballet has continued to stage this version of the Nutcracker every year since 1954, and it's this production that's largely responsible not only for introducing the Nutcracker to an international audience, but also for turning it into a cultural phenomenon. Since the 1960s, the ballet has also been televised regularly, which has made it accessible to millions of people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford the privilege of seeing it live. And this means that for many, watching the Nutcracker is a part of their Christmas tradition. They remember its joyful, festive sparkle from when they were children. And so do their parents, and in some cases, even their grandparents. So the ballet has become indelibly linked with the Christmas season. There have also been several attempts over the years to create a screen version of the Nutcracker. Um, some of these adaptations take their cue from the ballet, some attempt to go back to the original Hoffman story, and some actually make up a whole new plot, inspired by Tchaikovsky's music. The most recent of these adaptations was the Disney film, The Nutcracker and the Four Realms, which was released in 2018 and which featured an all-star cast, including a brief dance cameo from the prima ballerina, Misty Copeland. Personally, I thought this version of the story looked wonderful. The film had fabulous sets and costumes and really sumptuous and imaginative art direction. However, it was badly let down by a very lacklustre script that featured a frustratingly cliched plot and rather weak characterizations. In one sense, of course, that has been the story of the Nutcracker Ballet right from its inception. It has plenty of style, but not much substance. Even in 1892, viewers who enjoyed the glittering stage spectacle were also still frustrated or puzzled by the lack of story and characterization. And this is an ironic fate for the Nutcracker, given that Hoffman's original story is so complex and contains all sorts of deep and dark elements. It's doubly ironic, given that there's also so much depth in Tchaikovsky's music. Today, the most famous parts of his score for the Nutcracker are the more uplifting pieces, such as the fun and sprightly dance of the reed pipes or the gorgeously melodic Waltz of the Flowers. However, when taken as a whole, the score for the ballet contains many contrasts and evokes many different emotions. It is, by turns, vibrant, playful, melancholic, evocative, rousing, dark, brilliant and joyful. And in the dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, which is one of the most iconic parts of the score, there's a subtle sense of eerie menace beneath the sugariness that has the ability to make my hair stand on end, no matter how many times I hear it. That eeriness is partly down to Tchaikovsky's use of a celesta in the piece, and this is a musical instrument that looks and works very much like a piano, apart from the fact that the hammers strike onto metal plates instead of strings. It produces a sweet but rather uncanny chiming sound that Tchaikovsky used to stunning effect in The Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. Overall, the music is an inspiring triumph 
of merging styles and themes. And in order to do it justice, and to rebalance the disparity between the first and second acts, various choreographers over the years have attempted to adapt or completely reimagine the libretto of the ballet in order to try and make the story more coherent and more accessible to a modern audience. Personally, I think this is a good thing. Ah, there are some very valid reasons for wanting to update the second act in particular, partly because of the lack of plot in the original, but also because some of the characterizations in the character dances rely on rather unsatisfactory racial stereotypes that simply don't have a place in contemporary society. I also think it's a testament to Tchaikovsky's music that it can withstand being separated from its original libretto so successfully. I've lost count of the number of productions I've seen of the Nutcracker Ballet over the years, and each of them has been slightly different. One of the great joys of the Nutcracker is, whether you're a ballet traditionalist or an admirer of contemporary dance, or even if you hate ballet altogether and would prefer to see a glitzy ice skating show instead, there's a version of the work to suit all tastes, and all of them keep Tchaikovsky's soaring score at their hearts. If he could travel in time, E.T.A. Hoffman would perhaps be somewhat startled to discover that, today, a version of his tale is not only performed on stages worldwide every Christmas, but it's also been converted into storybooks, cartoons, feature films, and even a video game. I hope he'd be pleased to find out that his surreal and glittering story continues to thrill and mystify generations of children and adults all over the world. And whichever version of the Nutcracker you choose to settle down with this Christmas, I hope you enjoy its sparkle and magic. Just watch out for the Mouse King. This brings me to the end of my talk about the Nutcracker, and I'd like to express my thanks and heartfelt gratitude once again to Shifty Russian ASMR for her lovely narration of the Stock Exchange and St. Petersburg Gazette reviews of the original Nutcracker Ballet. I'd also like to thank you for listening, and I hope you'll be able to join me again soon for another ASMR adventure. Until then, thank you for your company. Goodbye.